Oh my goodness. Make someone happy. Make just one someone happy. So I was talking to my friend Linda yesterday and and I don't know what got us on this vein, but um, she, we were talking about being out walking, just taking walks. I was walking Bella while I was talking to her. And she said that she was walking the other day and she came upon a family, a mother and a father with a, with a young child. And this child, a little, a little one, she didn't say how old she, the child was, but she said this little girl was so full of love. She was so bubbly and exuberant, not a care in the world. And it, it affected Linda so deeply that days later she's still carrying this memory <coughs> and that feeling that was shared by this little one. It just shifted everything. Who we are makes such a difference in the world even when we don't know it. When we're not paying attention, we are still affecting people. We're still affecting the vibration and that, that energy that is resonating throughout the world. Now we know this, I know we know this, but do we remember it? I didn't remember it so much the other day when I was in a parking lot. I have a pet peeve. Any of you have pet peeves? No, not at all, Ann. I know you and I never track each other. One, one, apparently I have more, of my pet peeves is codependent drivers. Anybody know what I'm talking about? They are the people that stop the flow of traffic to allow you to go when it is not your right of way. To me, I, I'm a, a codependency recovery counselor. You probably don't know that about me, but I did that for many years. I have 28,000 doctorates in codependency. So I counsel from that that I know. So when I use that term, I really mean it. And, you know, accidents happen that way. And so I was in a parking lot here in town, and this car wanted me to go. And it, I, I ended up, instead of turning left in front of them, I turned right and went around and came back around. They were waiting for a parking spot. A short story, I was annoyed. I was really annoyed. It was one of those instances, if I had turned left, I very well could have had somebody else come up behind them and go around them to turn into the bank. And as I was sitting there, that's exactly what happened. And they're just sitting there being nice. You can't fault them for having the intention of being nice. I don't even know what started me on this path. I, I remember now, we make a difference. How we show up in the world makes a difference. And I was very aware of feeling annoyed um, by the driving behavior of this person in the car who I couldn't see, and I hope they couldn't see me. You know, after you drive away, you go, oh, I hope I didn't know that person. But, um, you know, because I'm a minister, I'm supposed to be better than that, right? If Janie McMillan were sitting here, uh, she would say, oh, what, you're human? Oh, did you forget the inhuman? So we do get into our humanness, don't we? So I think I kind of diverted from where I had no idea I was going with that. 
but who we are truly does make a difference. How we drive in the world, when we think that we're being nice, sometimes we are being nice in a way that doesn't really serve, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's all about balance. It's about balance and paying attention to what is going on in the world. So I started this off with Linda's story about the exuberant little girl and how that shifted and changed her day and the days continuing. And as she was telling that story, I could, I could feel Linda's joy from seeing that. So that ripple effect just kept happening and happening and happening. <clears throat> Tomorrow is the eclipse. I plan on being on a Zoom meeting with my family in Richmond, Indiana and get to experience the total eclipse over Zoom. Uh, out here, I think we get maybe 40%, something like that. There, when I was home just a couple weeks ago, every restaurant we went into, everywhere around us on the, the news, on the TV, everything, it was just because they are in the pathway of, of totality, it was all of this conversation. You, you probably have heard of plan ahead, make sure you've got gas in your car, make sure you've got cash, make sure you've got groceries. There are going to be so many tourists and visitors in town. Make sure you've got everything you need. I mean, they're, they're actually predicting disaster type behavior because the roads are going to be so crazy. Oh, but in that same conversation I was having with Linda, she shared with me that her brother and sister-in-law, the last eclipse, wherever it was, they went, they drove several hours away. So I guess there is some truth to that because they did not leave the next day after the eclipse. They left right after the eclipse and they got stuck in a 10-hour traffic jam. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. It's something, isn't it? That doesn't mean anything except I just find that so amazingly interesting. It doesn't have anything to do with my talk. Except I bet that a lot of those people, while they were sitting in that 10-hour traffic jam, had a lot of thoughts about other drivers and different <laughs> things going on. So whatever beautiful experience happened to them during the totality of the eclipse probably got completely washed away with a whole bunch of negativity and toxic energy for having to sit in traffic that long. We have such an opportunity to pay attention to how we are showing up in the world. One of my titles for this talk is Darkness Cannot Obscure Your Light. Tomorrow in North America, as the moon eclipses the sun, there will be so much darkness for that short period of time. But it's significant. I remember a, a, an eclipse when I was very, very young. And I can still feel what that was like. Have any of you ever experienced either a total or a near total eclipse? Probably, right? Do you remember how that felt? To be to have the darkness come over at a time when it's not expected. It's a different reality, it truly is. And again, if we're paying attention, we can just come into a different awareness of what is going on around us. We can come into an awe and amazement of the universe that we live in. Of what it feels like to be a, a solitary human being 
on this planet with millions upon millions of others having the opportunity to experience creation in a way that is so unique to us. The point that I'm wanting to make is how amazingly powerful each and every one of us is. I know, I feel like I say this often, but I, I want us to get it. I want us to go come, come up into a greater remembering of what that is like. I read a post on Facebook with a Unity Minister colleague of mine, and she was talking years ago about how she was in a, a workshop, a seminar, at that time, she was a Unity student, and she there was another Unity minister that was teaching the, the class, and it was on healing, and how the minister invited them to come into an awareness of their body, and how so often we focus on what is hurting us. We tend to have our attention on on what's not working right, that seems to be out of order. And this minister had them go to the place of, of putting all of that aside, as in not putting their attention on it, and instead to put their finite attention on everything in their body that was working. to just shift the attention and to give thanks. And as my friend said, there wasn't enough time to even begin to name all the different things within her body that were working wonderfully. And even the things that she doesn't even know exist in the operation of of the humans that we are. We spend so much time putting our attention on the difficulty, on the fear. We are using, when we do that, we are using our power in a way that does not serve us or anyone else. Now again, that does not mean that we don't take time to acknowledge what isn't working. For me, I tell you all the time, it's in the acknowledgement, it's in the recognition that allows me to say hello to it so that it quits bothering me so much. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just like a hungry toddler who's just going to keep at you and at you and at you until you feed it, right? It just wants enough attention to say, ouch, I hurt. Is there something we can do about this? And then we can be proactive and do what we need to do to take care of the harm, and in the meantime, flood our whole being, our whole being with the beauty and the gratitude and thanksgiving of everything that is wonderful and that works. This is by Carlos Castaneda. Anything is one of a million paths. Therefore, you must always keep in mind that a path is only a path. If you feel you should not follow it, you must not stay with it under any conditions. To have such clarity, you must lead a disciplined life. Only then will you know that any path is only a path, and there is no affront to oneself or to others. In dropping it, if, in dropping it, if that is what your heart tells you to do. It's just a path. 
It's a choice. But your decision to keep on the path or to leave it must be free of fear or ambition. I warn you, look at every path closely and deliberately. This question is one that only a very old man asks. Does this path have a heart? And what I think he means by that, he may very well be talking about himself, is looking back in retrospect at the choices that have been taken. Are we taking the path with heart? What pathways have we taken that were out of fear? And it took us a long time to get back around to the path with heart. One makes for a joyful journey as long as you follow the heart. You are one with it. The other will make you curse your life. One makes you strong, the other weakens you. Always ask, does this path have heart? Does this behavior have heart? Does this action have heart? And my friend Robin says, there is so much that is good and true in this world that I choose to turn down the noise of the competitive media screaming for attention. I will continue to send all the healing energies I can to those who suffer. But my focus needs to remain on creating the world I want to manifest for all beings. This is an area where I can get stuck. I told you I'm a great codependent. Oh, no, I'm going to rephrase that. I used to be a really good codependent. I am so much better than I used to be. I can't even tell you. Or I could, but you would be bored. But where I get stuck is when I am practicing spiritual principle and holding the truth and discerning what is mine to do and being in the, in the feeling and energy of forgiveness of allowing for the knowing that there truly is order in all things and focus on the good and the positive. And then I think about all the starving children. I usually, my mind usually goes first to the children, not adults. We are also just as important. But I think you know what I mean, whatever that is for you. And I go to that place where, oh, I want to be here, where I am holding on to the love and the joy and the peace and the comfort. Oh, but if I do that, then I'm not, I'm not, I'm not helping here. Anybody else have that? It's, it's a conundrum. It can be. But as Robin says, I choose to turn down the noise. You don't have to turn it off, but you can turn it down. And I will continue to send all the healing energies I can to those who suffer. We continue to see the physical reality of what is going on in our world. And yet we are spiritual true students. And we know the power of love. And at least we have an inkling of the power of who we are. The healing does not come by fully focusing on the suffering. The healing comes by acknowledging the pain and then focusing on creating the world that we want to manifest. We are not doing anyone any good <clears throat> if we are behaving in codependent ways. 
We just aren't. We're not in our power. We are not allowing for the power of the other person. And we're just draining, draining the love away from the healing. We can both see what is happening and we can know the truth of love and might and power. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because that is where the healing is. <coughs> so in closing, I want to share with you Marianne Williamson's reading from her book, A Return to Love, and I know many, if not all of you know this. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously, or consciously, give other per people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. What if you truly allowed yourself for even just a few moments a day to actually believe that. What difference could we make on the planet? We could still help to feed those who are hungry. We could still help to find housing for those that are unhoused. We could still help to lead people to safety. All the while seeing them not as wounded and defeated but as full of potential. I invite you to be that power. Who you are truly does make a difference, and your light is always, always, always shining. And so it is. <coughs>